Hello and welcome to Dark Side Scenics. In this video I'll show you how I made this castle diorama. This was a huge project which took over 10,000 stones to complete. Starting with a basic timber frame, a piece of ply is screwed on to make the base. Gorilla wood glue is spread over the ply before adding the first layer of Celotex. The second layer of Celotex is added to create the height required. And then it's weighted down and left overnight to dry. Hot wire cutters don't work particularly well on this type of Celotex, so this bread knife does the trick. And here's the basic shape I ended up with. To give the diorama a nice neat finish, I'm screwing on some MDF to the sides. I'm going to have some lighting on this diorama, so this is to create a hole for the switch. All the holes and gaps are filled and sanded, ready for the next stage. This is the first time I've used Molder Scene from Woodland Scenics. It was available at my local model shop at the South Devon Railway, so I thought I would give it a try. It's quite gritty in texture and you're supposed to leave it soaking in water for a couple of minutes before kneading it with your hands. As you can see, I didn't do that, but it worked absolutely fine. To create a smooth texture, you can spray it with some soapy water and then rub it with your finger. And now the entire model is covered, it's left overnight to dry. Moving on to the rocks, I have a few of these moulds from Woodland Scenics. The moulds don't always sit level, so I've created this card template for it to sit in. And now to mix the plaster of Paris ready for pouring. I usually leave these overnight to fully dry before removing them from the mould. The moulds are quite stiff and the plaster is obviously brittle, so it's not always easy to take them out of the mould. I find that a quick blast from a hot hairdryer helps to release them. As you can see, I made a very large batch of the rocks. They're stuck onto the model with scenic glue. To blend the rocks together, I find sculptor mould is the best option. It dries quite quickly, so I just mix it in small batches. The sculptor mould is added on the edges and in all the gaps to give the illusion that it's one rock face. When that's dry, some polyfiller is mixed with water and then brushed over the entire rock face. Before it's dry, it can be stippled with the brush to give a nice rock effect. One of many examples of poor planning, I'm just creating a space for the bridge.
I usually use Sculpt Mold Compound, which is white and needs painting, but in hindsight, I probably didn't need to paint this. The reason for painting it brown is in case there are any gaps in your static grass or earth texture later on. When painting the rocks, I usually use two or three washes for the base coat. The diorama often looks awful at this point and I'm always very keen to move on to the next stage. Matte Mod Podge is brushed over the entire earth surface ready for the earth texture. If you have seen some of my other videos, you'll know that I use a mixture of brown tile grout and Woodland Scenics Fine Turf. After brushing off any loose earth texture from the rocks, I spray it with soapy water and then some Woodland Scenics Scenic Cement. The next stage on the rocks is to water down some matte black paint and apply it with a pipette. To cover up the mess I made, I mixed up some paints for the seabed area. The brown grout is slightly too dark for sand, so I'm mixing some plaster of Paris with it to create the right tone. More of the matte Mod Podge is used to fix it in place. A light grey acrylic paint is dry brushed onto the rocks to pick out some of the details. To create the bridge, I have some balsa wood which I'm scraping with a sharp knife to remove the perfect edges. And a junior hacksaw blade helps to create a bark effect. Black and brown acrylic paint is mixed into a wash ready for painting. Before the paint dried, I rolled it on some kitchen paper, which seemed to work quite well. The same wash was used on some matchsticks before leaving them all to dry. The bridge supports are temporarily taped to the cutting mats to stop them from moving. Some of the matchsticks are cut slightly shorter to allow space for the vertical supports. These matchsticks are being attached with scenic glue. The MDF usually needs two coats of paint, so I'm giving it the first coat now. And now to start the castle, I thought I'd experiment with Pringles tubes for the castle towers. 
This is a two-part epoxy putty which I'm using to create these stones around the arrow slits. The two are mixed in equal parts and it's quite sticky so you don't need to glue it to the cardboard. For the remainder of the stonework, these medium light grey stones from WWS will be attached using scenic glue. This does take a huge amount of time, but I used this technique on the stone bridge and stone barn videos and I was really pleased with the results. The wooden boards at the top are created using the matchsticks. When the boards were finished I created the turrets and then used a dark grey wash. I was fairly happy with the experiment so decided I would use this technique for the remainder of the castle. This is 1.5mm card which I'm cutting to shape for the other parts of the castle. I am cutting out the turrets on this template to make it easier to build up the stonework. While I check to ensure everything's in the right place, I'm using hobby tack to temporarily hold the structure. The positions of the arrow slits are roughly marked out before I take it to bits to cut them on the board. As I mentioned earlier, lighting will be added to this diorama, so I'm leaving a hole in the base for the wiring. Now I'm happy with the shapes and sizes, I can permanently fix it in place with Yoohoo. I gave it a quick spray of grey acrylic primer and then also used some filler on the joints to ensure there's no light bleed later on. And the top is glued in place with the help of a few supports. This will be the front of the castle which will have a large gate and also a portcullis. To get a quick hold on some of these awkward pieces I use superglue and then superglue activator. This is the second tower and you'll see the easiest way to create the arrow slits here is to use a Dremel. I'm just having to create a top for this tower for the matchsticks to be added later. The entire tower is covered in acrylic grey primer. As with the first tower, I'm using matchsticks to create the boards.
This is a small hatch to create access to the roof. To create a grimy wash for the floorboards, I've got some black and some brown acrylic paint. As I got to certain stages of the stonework, I could glue one part to the other part of the castle. I'm marking out the position of the castle here so I can consider where the wires will come through from the base. After drilling the correct position, these tubes are pushed through and then held in place using superglue. For the lighting, this Gauge Master kit has the PCB and the LEDs I need. I picked up the 9V battery holder from eBay. Now you will notice here that my soldering skills are pretty poor and also I have very limited electrical knowledge so I would always consult a qualified electrician before doing anything like this. This is Pico wiring, which is stripped at the ends and cut to size. Each LED has a 1K resistor soldered to it on the positive side. Each part of the castle is a separate section, so I'm feeding a tube through for each wire. A small amount of dash clay helps to hold the other end. It's generally recommended that you cover any bare wire with some heat shrink. I don't have a heat gun so I'm just carefully using the side of my soldering iron. When each light is done I test it with a 3 volt battery. Each light is pushed through the tube and all fit quite snugly so there's no chance of them falling through. Each LED is wired up to the circuits using connector strips. And a quick test shows everything's working as it should be. Moving back to the horrendous job of the stonework, I keep adding more to each section. Although I used two-part epoxy putty earlier for these stones, this is actually dash clay which is air drying so I do need to glue it in place. When I did the stone barn video this cornerstone technique worked really well. When the stones have been shaped correctly they can be attached with scenic glue. The same process is used for the stone archway.
before finishing the stonework I need to create quite a few doors. This wood is 1.5mm thick. 0.8mm balsa wood is used for the hinges. To give the illusion that each door is made of several planks of wood, I'm just cutting slightly with a sharp knife and then scoring it again. The hinges are given a coat of matte black paint and then left on a piece of baking parchment to dry. A few different washes are painted onto the doors. The brown is the main colour, but the darker washes help to pick out the separation between the planks of wood. When the doors have dried, a small amount of scenic glue is added to attach the hinges. A final wash is added to blend it all together. Each door is glued into place before a stone lintel is added above it. And now I'm at the point where all the pieces can be glued together so I can finish the stonework. The cardboard is still showing so I need to add a few layers of stones on the very top. The stones which are made from dash clay or epoxy putty are very smooth, so by using some polyfiller and stepping this on with a brush it creates a far better stone effect. You can see here a small amount of water is added to the polyfiller. To make the clay and the putty stones the same colour as the others, I'm using a grey wash over all of them. Using a soft brush, plaster of Paris is worked into all of the gaps between the stones. and it's given a quick spray of soapy water. I created three separate acrylic washes and then painted them onto the stonework. When creating the doors earlier, I didn't do the main gate, so I'm using the same technique but with a slightly larger door. I wanted a portcullis in front of the main door, so this is more of the 0.8mm balsa wood. All of the pieces are glued together with scenic glue. It was taken outside and sprayed with a dark grey acrylic before adding some rust effects. This is Humbrol Satin Coat which is dabbed on in various places before adding some rust weathering powder.
and the point of no return is to glue the castle in place and then fill in all the gaps with polyfiller. And to blend it in with the surrounding terrain it's given the same coat of brown acrylic followed by some earth texture. Now it also seems like a good idea to fix the bridge in position. The earth texture is brushed into the gaps and then is sprayed with soapy water and then some scenic cement. After the earth texture is fully dry, I can add the static grass. This basing glue is brushed over the earth texture, leaving a few gaps where there might be patches in the grass. This is the WWS Pro Static Grass Applicator. The grass I'm using as a base layer is Winter 2mm from Pico, which is also manufactured by WWS. I prefer to wait for the base layer to fully dry before vacuuming the excess. I'm applying the layering spray in small patches before adding some 4mm patchy grass from WWS. And the final bit of variation on the grass is some 4mm golden wheat, also from WWS. I've tipped the model on its side here to make the application of weathering products slightly easier. This is Woodland Scenic's Burnt Grass Fine Turf and it's just brushed into the gaps to replicate moss or greenery. And it's held in place with a fine spray of Woodland Scenic's Scenic Cement. Light green and olive green fine leaf foliage is glued into random places all over the model. I often find that these bushes don't always blend in initially. I use a selection of green and brown scatters around the bushes and it just helps to blend it into the surrounding greenery. And yet again it needs a quick spray of soapy water and then some scenic cement. Before pouring the resin I need to create a dam around the edge. Masking tape works really well for this but to be absolutely sure I use a fine bead of wooden scenic scenic glue along the join. I'm giving that 24 hours to dry so it means I can move on with some more weathering of the stone. I'm only using two colours here, the green and the black, to create streaks on the stonework. This deep pour water resin is clear so I need to add some water tints for some subtle colour. I have a video on my channel which goes into more detail on how to work with the deep pour water. The quick version is that it's warmed up, gently tipped back and forth and then mixed. I only used a few drops of the turquoise and a few of the moss green to give a subtle colour effect. You can see here that the depth on the model is only about 1cm, so you don't get the same colour that you do in the deeper cup. I could have added some more drops of colour, but as this is based on a British scene, I didn't want anything too vibrant.
There are a couple of wooden sticks included in the pack to help the resin reach those hard to reach areas. After around 24 hours I could peel off the tape leaving a nice neat edge. Some of the masking tape was left behind but I just rubbed that with some soapy water later on to remove it. This is the first time I've used water ripples from Woodland Scenics. It's very simple to use straight out of the pot, it's just stippled on with a brush. It takes a long time to dry and tends to sink down slightly so you do need to keep working it while it dries. I picked up some very useful tips on this from one of the Merrick's videos at High Eye Workshop. I made some final adjustments by breaking some of the boards on the bridge and adding some more bushes, but Covid finally caught me near the end of the project so I decided to leave it there. I'd be very interested to see some comments on what you would do with the model from here. It could be made into a historical scene with some figures or go further down the abandoned route. I took the castle to the Dartmouth area one evening to try to get some photos in the sunset and also some when it got dark to test the lighting. I hope you enjoyed the video and thanks for watching.